Um, just to follow on from um, the MC, I'd like to dedicate this talk to uh, Larry Tesla, who passed away. Uh, if you think, imagine at any point in your career designing a feature as important as copy and paste. Um, so this is for you, Larry. <clears throat> so what I'd like to talk to you about today is designing for speed, design for friction. My talk is broken down into several parts. I'm going to cover a lot of research, um, and I'm going to give lots of UX examples. But the first part, I'm going to tell three stories, um, which allude to the rest of the talk. But before I actually get onto it, I want to give some definitions. When I'm talking about speed, I'm speaking about the technical things you can do to improve the speed of your site. So, you know, optimizing Im images, minifying code, stuff like that. When I'm speaking about friction, I'm talking about the things that we do to s deliberately slow down the user um, and distract them. And by the end of the talk, I'm sure I'll have convinced you that slowing someone down actually makes them speed up, which makes no sense, but it will do. Um, now, there we go. If there's anything you remember uh, in this talk, and there's going to be a lot of stuff, uh, it's this story you should remember. And it's a story of occupied and unoccupied time. And it's pretty much the sort of summary of the entire talk. Now, Houston Airport had this really big problem. Um, they had passengers would complain about the time it would take for suitcases to arrive in the terminal building when the plane had landed. So Houston started investing millions into solving this big pain point. They improved the process, they hired more people, they got more new tech, and they got the, the, the time down to seven minutes, which is really impressive. Plane lands, seven minutes later, suitcases arrive. Uh, but people still complained. Whoops. Clicker not working. So that face, if you can see it, that's the face of every UX designer when you try to do something and the user still complain. <laughs> what do you want? Um, so they thought, OK, how can we reframe this problem? It's like you can't optimize anymore. It gets to a point where you optimize the design, uh, you actually degrade on the experience. I mean, you could get the suitcases faster by throwing them across the terminal building, but the experience will be bad, right? So they reframed the problem. It's like, okay, it's not the speed as much. It's more so much as the waiting for the bags are annoying. And what they discovered was when they were assessing how the planes would land, they realized that the planes parked really close to the terminal building. So they fought. What would happen if we parked the planes further away from the terminal building? And complaints dropped to zero. <laughs> Very evil. I could talk about the ethics of this, but I won't. Um, so what is happening there? Well, seven minutes divided up. The first minute, you're walking to the terminal building, and then you're waiting forever for uh, your bags. Reverse that, six minutes, you walk in, one minute, you're waiting. It's magic, your bags appear. If there's anything you remember, this story is great at dinner parties. Um, so, legacy systems, this is a very common problem for a lot of uh, website makers. You have systems built with old code. Uh, co I can't say code. Code? Uh, old code. Uh, you can't just rip stuff out. You hear these new technology acronyms all the time, you know, PWA, TWA, AMP, whatever. You want to do these things, but you can't. And this is like the story of a slow elevator. So, manage building managers get these complaints from their tenants. Um, you know, the elevator is too slow. And this is a big problem for them because you will lose tenants eventually. Uh, oftentimes they'll say, okay, clicker is not working. No, they don't say that. Right, so they say, make elevator faster. So what do you do? You install new motors, uh, you upgrade the systems, create new algorithms, stuff like that. Uh, Feasible-wise, this is expensive. You can't really do this. Like, to rip out an elevator, is a long process and means less elevators in the building. And it's the same sort of thing if you've got like an old site using legacy WordPress. Ripping stuff out is not a feasible thing to do. Um, so again, you reframe the problem. It's not so much the elevator is too slow. So building managers will test people. What they'll do is they'll employ, they'll reframe the problem. Um, they'll say, okay, it's the waiting that's annoying. So what they'll do is they'll put up mirrors, play music, and install a hand sanitizer. And magically, it feels faster. So in the talk, I'm going to give some UX examples of the equivalents that you can actually do. But it's something to think about. And this is usually the first step for anyone who wants to actually build for speed. Um, the final story is a story of search. Now, way back when, um, finding stuff on the web was really hard. It was a complex problem. Uh, oftentimes in UX, you have a choice. Uh, you either solve complexity for your user, or you pass on the complexity to the user. Um, and for a long time, search was passed on to complexity. Because coming up with a very clever classification system is a hard thing to do. Um, so what did we do? An input field, 
uh, widgets and a sea of UI. It's like that seems to be the first thing as designers we do. We just chuck some UI at it. That will fix the problem. Um, but not, oftentimes, it's the opposite effect. The, more powerful, the, the powerful thing to do is to remove features, I find, because then you focus the experience. So again, reframing the problem. Finding the wrong content is annoying. So what do you do? You come up with a good classification system. Now, this isn't a simple thing to do. Our founders at Google are PhD students. And if you know about anything about academia, how you classify good science is citations. Generally speaking, the more citations, the better the paper, and vice versa. So you replace citations with the concept of links. Now you only need three pieces of UI, search input field um, and two buttons. And that's it. And that was a radical thing. Now it's like accepted, but it's very radical at the time. So instead of uh, passing on the complexity, you solve the complexity. Now, to chalk up these experiences, slow low friction, slow high friction, fast high friction, fast low friction. This is where you don't want to be. And on all these stories, this is where most people start out. The system is slow, and there's nothing distracting the users. There's no walking to the terminal building. Oftentimes, you'll start up here when you start optimizing for speed, you know, the small hacky things that you can do to hack user perception. Most people end up fast high friction because a lot of sites contain media. And there comes a point where you can't really optimize anymore without degrading the experience. Um, this is where we, everyone wants to be. This is like the best place, just being fast and no friction at all. And you think about search, it's not just technically fast, it's perceptively fast as well. Like simple UI allows people to get to the experience as quickly as possible. So like uh, ages ago, Facebook went from a hamburger menu to bottom navigation in one of their experiments. And they found that users thought it was perceptively faster because instead of two taps, it's one tap to find the actual thing that you're looking for. So the perceptive speed is really important. And like I said, like, there's an issue in Silicon Valley, and I think technolo the technology industry as a whole, where we think adding features increase value, where adding features actually decreases the experience and the focus, which is a really big problem. Um, so speed is broken, it's broken down into two things, the real and the perceived. Um, so now I'm going to talk about technical speed, then I'm going to move on to the other uh, topics. So a story of financial times. Uh, the Financial Times is a financial newspaper in the UK. That's one fact about them. Another fact is they have a very expensive su subscription model and also a very low budget. They can't target every type of user. So what they did was they come up with this clever little algorithm called the tipping point. When a user visits the site and reads five articles a month, that user is more likely to subscribe. If they can push that user to nine articles a month, then they'll definitely subscribe. But what they found, simply by making the site one second faster, they increased engagement for everybody. So this is really critical from a technical point of view. I know most of you are designers, but to be thinking about this is really important. Um, likewise, the opposite is also true. Like we find 51% of users will abandon um, a site like, and not finish a purchase if it loads slowly. Like of the top three things, um, the other two are difficult to navigate and difficult to find. Again, these are perceptive things. If I can't find what I want to do, the thing is too slow, I will just leave. Um, now, user behavior is affected by many different things. Uh, now, these are the ones which I come up with based on the research I've been involved in. Uh, so, occupied time we've spoken about, intention, state of mind, state of body, I'll go on to. Um, importance is a weird one. Whenever you do a study on speed, oftentimes you'll slow down an experience to see what is the breaking point where people will just abandon. And then after 20 minutes, people are still using the site. And you think, what's wrong with you? <laughs> oftentimes that indicates importance. So if you're in a foreign country, you're trying to get the map to load, you're going to wait. If you're looking for the address of a hospital and the website's taking forever to load, you're going to wait. It's important. If you have to fill out a tax return on a government site, uh, you have to wait. There is no choice. That's a bad thing to depend on because users will never forget that experience, especially if they're in an anxious point. Uh, but it's important to note that that's a, that's a factor of that will affect the user behavior. So let's go on to intention. 30% of users on the mobile web are just window shopping. They have, nothing, they have no intention, they're just, you know, doctor's office, bus stop, whatever. This goes up slightly for retail sites, which is 34%. 30% actually want to find something out that they might do in the future. Uh, this goes up to 49% for travel sites, which again makes sense. You want to find out when the next holiday is cheaper. 29% um, of people actually want to do something there and there. This goes up to 57% for financial sites, which makes sense, because no one just checks out you know, insurance for a laugh. But the question is, is like the financial times, can we get people to jump from one bucket to another? Does a slow experience impact this? That's food for thought. 
State of body, state of mind. When I first saw this, I was quite surprised. Most people on the mobile web are visiting stuff from home. But when you think about it, it makes sense. Wi-Fi connection, stable. You haven't got a boss over, looking over your shoulder saying, why are you on Amazon all day? Um, unless you work for Amazon. Uh, and then like people relax when they're at home. Like When you're anxious, you won't complete a transaction. And incidentally, experiences feel faster when you're sat down. If you're standing up, walking around, they'll feel slower. Uh, my assumption is, is uh, more adrenaline in the body means your brain will process things faster, everything slows down. But what are we doing on the mobile web that's slowing things down for people? Like Most people worldwide are on a 2G connection. So what can we do to actually optimize this? Oops, am I jumping? Okay. So this is the UX hierarchy. Um, the most important thing for users is how long it takes for a page to load. Thereafter, um, how easy it is to find something, how well if a site fits on my screen, and how simple it is to use. All of those things are about perception. Like, remember the UX of speed? It's not just about the technical speed, it's about the perception. How attractive a site looks is at the bottom, which is depressing, because I studied graphic design 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, branding is important. Branding is very critical for like recognizability, but if you ask users the most important thing on the mobile web, they say speed. So here's some quick wins. Um, Paul Boag, I hope I pronounced your surname properly, uh, mentioned this uh, briefly in his talk. Uh, so images make up a large portion of web pages, about 52% of the weight of a page. So me and my team, we designed that called Squoosh. It's I might not be able to give a demo because I have to switch screens, but anyways, you can check it out. Uh, so Squoosh is a progressive web app. You drag and drop images onto it, and then you can compress them. Uh, and we demoed this. Well, I can't do the demo. Yeah. So we demoed this at Chrome Dev Summit 2018, and even our own uh, marketing websites, we managed to reduce them by 83%. A simple process. So the idea is you load an image, and you can change the settings, and you can download the image. Like As designers, whenever we're supplying these graphics to like developers, this is an easy thing to do. Um, you can put it like WordPress has plugins to do this sort of thing, uh, or Drupal, or whatever the common thing is these days. Uh, but please do. Optimize image. It's the one thing you can do. It's so simple to do. Uh, so you can check out squoosh.app. Uh, and if you're into like um, progressive web apps, you can actually steal the code for free from our labs. Uh, but speed matters, but the perception of speed is just as important. And this is a very scary statistic. Um, a third of users still perceive technically fast sites to be slow. So what are we doing? Right, what's going on? You've optimized everything, so what can you do next? Um, so the first part is perception, putting navigation front and center. Now, you all look like a bunch of normal people. I say that really menacing as I drink water. But I'm not normal. <clears throat> Have you ever asked yourselves this question, what makes a button a button? It's a weird thing, it's quite philosophical for designers, but an important one. You know, buttons should always look inviting. In the physical world, you have like light, clanks, clicks. Quite often, car designers actually design the mechanism to make sounds because they're satisfying. They don't need those sounds. It's like an affordance to give, say, yes, the door is closed. Um, we don't really have that on the digital, in the digital world yet, but what we do have is so I'm about to trash material design, which is very dangerous for a designer from Google. <coughs> <laughs> Going out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> the context of designers, you're in Sketch, Figma, Flash, Once Upon a Time, Photoshop, whatever. Your design is elegant piece of design. It's balanced. The typography is perfect. But no one recognizes that it's a button. That's the one over there. Text buttons are really hard to recognize. The ugly one, which is like, hey, I'm a button. People recognize that. People see that. Like, it's really important to make affordances obvious to users. There's no um, value in hiding the, the, the functions. So, also, the function should be clear of a button. Uh, does anyone here speak Japanese? Because the rest of the talk's in Japanese. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that joke works every time. I'm still waiting for someone to say yes. I'm like, yay! So, this user of Excel asked this important question. And the question is, why is the save icon a vending machine? The visual, I, visual things change with time, right? The save icon's been mentioned many times. It's like 20 years ago <laughs> when I was a student, they were still used. Um, but visual metaphors change with time, and with cultures, things translate very differently. People start looking at the shapes rather than understanding the meaning. Uh, so when I was working on this talk, I had a bunch of icons up, and my daughter walked into my study and asked, 
are you a detective? <laughs> I hadn't really occurred to me that this was like from Sherlock Holmes, because we were born and raised in the UK. Most kids are indoctrinated with Sherlock Holmes. Being a detective, you have the hat, you have the magnifying glass. Incidentally, when this icon was shown to rural India, they asked a different question. Why is a search icon a ping pong paddle? <laughs> when you are using icons, always use a label. Now, to my German and Dutch friends, I know your words are a mile long. I am sorry. But if you're going to use icons, always use a label. Like, there's no value in hiding things. Right, most of you are designers, so you definitely have iPhones. And in a second, you're all going to take out your iPhones. I guarantee you. And that's, you're trying to select a piece of text. You're trying to select it, doesn't work. Try to select it again, doesn't work. This is wrong. What you're supposed to do is hold down the space bar, and the keyboard turns into a trackpad. And everyone's going to start taking out their phones, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, it really is. No one knows this. And you lot are power users. Hide your UX, and this is what happens. Uh, but we have the same problem on Android. If you want to switch between like uh, tabs in Chrome, you just swipe the URL bar. And if you want to know the history of a page, you hold down the back button, which will happen in a sec. Go back to the Guardian, and you see your history there. But nobody knows this. If critical paths of your experience are hidden, people are not going to tap or click on them. That's just a fact of life. So if you want low conversions, hide your UX. Um, relationships between items uh, imply uh, that closeness to items, proximity implies relationships. So I was on a plane, and the whole flight, the same thing happened again and again. Uh, the toilet sign will go to green. People will get up, walk to the toilet. They open this cupboard. Sorry, they open this door, and they realize it's a cupboard. And then the host says the whole flight, no, no, it's the one over here. Now, if you're on a plane, you open a door, and something weird happens, at that point, you're not opening any more doors. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> When you're doing UI, make sure that things are close to each other, like that are related to one another, because people will make or separate them if they're different, or if the relationship is not the same, because people will make these assumptions. Um, give fe visual feedback. So like the life of a button, you, tap, you see a button, you engage with a button, you get enraged by the button because it's not doing anything, and then you tap it again because maybe it didn't work right the first time. Uh, and oftentimes, you end up resetting the whole system by doing this, like you're doing this action. So in material design, we say, call this thing called the ripple. This is just how we apply things stylistically. Um, but it's just, a it's just telling the user, yes, we've accepted your command. The thing is working. Don't worry. We're processing. It's just a small visual feedback. So friction, I've only got five minutes, and I've got so much more to do, so time to speak even faster than I already am. Uh, so people are weird. The, the loading bar at the bottom, people think that's loading 11% faster than the rest because of the way the ripples are animating. People are weird. <laughs> we find that when you stagger animation, you start off slow, build up, the, the, the whole thing feels like it's loading faster. And remember the hand sanitizer and playing music? This is the equivalent doing these little distraction things on the web where you can um, will distract the user enough to give you time for your system or site to load. Um, <laughs> I'll get in so much trouble for this. <clears throat> YouTube, we animate this bar, and it, it hangs towards the end. That's fake. <laughs> Loading screens. So I won't really. This stuff is public. I just say that because it sounds funny. So loading screens, I've done a lot of research on loading screens because I have no life. <laughs> uh, so early la like late last year, I did a study on our documentation sites to see like, how people perceive different loads, if there is a difference, because some people argue there is no difference between loading screens. So there's five different variations. Loading a low pixel image, replacing it with a top uh, a quality image, a spinner, skeleton screen, no transitions whatsoever, and then a loading bar. And so like, when we did this study, we found that 90% uh, of users do know an actual, notice an actual difference. Uh, majority of users prefer content placeholders, that they find that's really important, that it makes the experience feel faster. And incidentally, when you're doing these studies, you show one video after another, then you ask a series of questions comparing the two. You're throwing some fake questions just to throw people off so they don't know you're talking about speed. At the end, you ask a one question for them to assess, was each one fast or slow, like as a sort of uh, scrubber? The skeleton screen received no votes for being slow. So this is my top four. I was going to do some music, but now nah, forget it. I've only got three minutes. Right, top four. This is the worst thing you can do, a blank screen. Don't do this, because people have no idea when, what is coming. 
Uh, next, coming on, a spinner. People have negative connotations with spinners, partly to do with the beach ball or the uh, sand dial. So, and also, it doesn't give any indication of how long something's going to load. Moving on from that, skeleton screens are popular, but the way we implement them is often wrong. Con conceptually, it's the same as a spinner. We wait, we wait, then we do this mass reveal of content. Um, also, gray boxes feel broken to users because of the color. Uh, what we find is the, whoops, the better approach is have metadata where possible, just to give a, some context to the user of the type of content that's coming. The moment something is ready to actually load, load it straight away. Um, do image replace with a low pixel one with a high pixel one. Again, you want to do all these small little things which are distracting. Think about, you know, um, Houston Airport story. That's basically what we're doing from a conceptual level. And again, it's all like depending on your own experiences. So on YouTube, when the connection slows down, what we do is we just load the video and we just gray out everything else. Like logic would dictate that the video is the heaviest thing on the page, um, therefore you leave it to last. But it's the most important thing on the page from a UX point of view, right? No one comes to see thumbnails. So like f always adapt these, like treat all these things as a plate of food. Take what works for your experiences and discard the rest. Again, like another example is Google Photos. A common behavior when people open up Google Photos is they'll start scrolling straight away. But you don't start loading those images till later on. So what you do is you have the first images in the viewport, you preload some, and then you load, load res images. But what the team wanted to do is to blur out all the images, because low res looks horrible. Like browsers, when they see a pixelate image, will partially blur things. But that also looks ugly. But what they found, when you add this filter to like 100 images, things slow down. So they said, no, let's default it to be pixelated. But then when you tap on an image, it will blur it out and then load the full uh, quality ones. So two different techniques for essentially the same thing. So like, you need to adapt these things. Like, Don't just go, right, we need to implement skeleton screens. No, think about your experiences in the context of what your users are doing. And work with your engineers to get the experience really fast. Um, so the final thing, distracting users. Uh, when Trivago's site goes offline, what happens is you get this fun little game. And they'll say, look, don't worry, you connect, you, the, your settings are saved. We're going to get you back online, just wait. And you know, dead zones happen all the time. And what they found is 67% of users came back for the experience. And that's quite powerful, right? I mean, you try pitching that to your boss. We're going to work on a fun game. But it worked, you know? And these are the things that we need to try to start doing more of. So like in summary, you know, reframe the problem. Think about user perception. Uh, keep navigation clear and simple. Um, avoid blank screens, show content as soon as possible. And always park the plane further away from the terminal. <laughs> I'm not done and you just clap. No, just I am sort of done. So I love giving away free stuff. We did a book with uh, awards.com, a collaboration. It's about speed. As more stuff about research. A lot of technical stuff, so you're an engineer, you'll love this. If you work with engineers, please do share it with them. It's a PDF. Yeah. <laughs> this is a book on progressive web apps. It's a website, but not a PWA. No. Um, but you can download. Please do check it out if you're interested in these features. And if you're a UX designer, don't bother clicking on this link. It's not worth it. But if you're not and you're interested in UX or you have work with people, who are, I've got a free course on Skillshare that you can just take for free. So with that, I say thank you so much and hope you enjoy the rest of the show.